Hi folks, it is Wednesday evening and we are back again for our Bible study. Uh, we are in Hebrews chapter 8. But before we start, let's pause and let's pray together. Father, we, we just do stop right now and come to you in prayer. We want to thank you for your continued presence and help with us uh, for the day that we've had, for the week that we've had. Uh, and Lord, just ask that as we come to your word now that you would just still and steady our hearts. Lord, there's been lots going on this past week already. Um, and as we sort of think about the world situation and about COVID vaccines being rolled out, we want to thank you for the advances that have been made. Lord, help us just to continue to be uh, considerate of one another, to look out for one another, um, to just to be mindful and to bring your love into different situations that we find ourselves in each and every day. But Lord, as we come to your word now, just as we say, still and calm our hearts, open our hearts and minds to you, to your words, to the prompting of your spirits, and help us to learn and grow closer to you, we pray. In Christ's name. Amen. So yeah, welcome folks. Uh, we're back in, like I say, back into Hebrews chapter 8 tonight. Uh, I just want to recap a little bit in what I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read from the second part of verse 8. Um, down to the end of the chapter. So let's hear these words. The day of the Lord is co the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by their hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the law, Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their gods and they will be my people. They will not need to teach their neighbours, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. And I will forgive their wickedness. And I will never again remember their sins. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of dates and will soon disappear. Amen. It's the end of Hebrews chapter 8. So again, just in recap, we talked about how the writer talks about Jesus being the new priest, the new high priest, and what that means, and about the new covenant. The old covenant of law and sacrifices um, is defunct, basically. That's what it says. It'll soon ups it's out of date and will soon disappear at the very end of the chapter. Um, because the new covenant is that Christ died once for everyone. And it's interesting. It's This is a quote that's taken from Jeremiah, um, chapter 31. Um, that, that is read there uh, from verse 8 down to verse 12. So it's Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. But it's interesting because it's pointing forward to Jesus and forward to the relationship with Jesus. Talking about, I will be their God and I will be my people. Um, they will not need to teach your neighbour, nor will they need to teach a relative, for they, sh they should know the Lord. Uh, it's nearly pointing forward towards heaven. Um, because... Until heaven comes, there's still, and until Jesus comes again, and uh, and if you think of Revelation twenty one, a new heaven and a new earth, until till Jesus comes and and sin is finally defeated, um, there is still that need to tell others about Jesus and about God, about what He has done for us. Whereas this looks past that. Um, even where it says, "I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins." You know, that's, again, it's it's talking of a perfect time. And we know that there's no perfect time here on earth. We know that we will never be perfect. The only time we will reach that perfection is whenever we get to heaven. So it's really interesting that the writer of Hebrews projects forward to that time, talking about this new covenant. So it's like the covenant, the new covenant is started. It is introduced um, by Jesus and um, we start to abide or live by that new covenant in that we, we are following the, to follow, following the teachings of, of Jesus uh, and that new covenant will be complete or come full circle 
at the time whenever we reach heaven um, uh, and the time whenever we are in God's presence. So just, it's interesting just how Hebrews covers so much uh, and such a, a vast period of time. Chapter 9 continues on that theme and actually continues about earth and heaven. So let me read to you the first um, few verses of Hebrews chapter 9. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place for worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room was a lampstand, a table and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain and behind the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. In that room were a gold it were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark was a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves and the stone tables of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the Ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. When these things were in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duty, but only the high priest ever entered the most high place, and only once a year. And he offered blood for his own sins and for the sins that people had committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most high place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. It's interesting that the writer of Hebrews finds it necessary to explain the tabernacle and the temple then as it became a flat when it moved from a tent to a building and how the holy place and the most holy place or the holy of holies operated. So the, the, the impression that you get from here is that the people who are listening to this are obviously not from a Jewish background uh, because they would have understood what the tabernacle and the temple were. They would have understood the different parts of it. They would have understood the ark being there and the significance of that. And yet at the end of verse 5, but we cannot explain these things in detail now. So he's writing to Gentiles. In other words, he's writing to you and I. Um, unless you're a Jewish person who's watching this um, broadcast, you are a Gentile. Uh, and you weren't involved in the worship as it happened in the temple. Um, you wouldn't have been privy to how the temple worked. That was for Jewish people. That was for God's chosen people. But now we are God's chosen people. Um, God's chosen people is not just the Jews any longer. It's anybody who follows Christ. It's anybody who believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God's son. That he came and he died for our sins. And that God wants us to have that relationship with him. Anybody who now believes that is God's chosen people and that is who the covenant the new covenant is for so it's interesting again the change which goes on between old covenant and new covenant the previous relationship with the Jewish nation and now the, the relationship with the whole earth all people who want to follow God uh, and it's interesting how he talks about this place where the earthly place where, where worship took place. Because again, a lot of scholars will talk about how God created the Garden of Eden. How it's meant to be the place of worship on earth. That's why he come, God comes out in the evening to walk with Adam and Eve. Sin comes in, access to it is barred. And then you have the tabernacle set up after the, the promises which are given, which is the Ten Commandments or the words of wisdom which are placed in the Ark of the Covenant. And then in time, David can't, but his son Solomon builds the temple. Again, to God's um, description, God's direction. David prepares, Solomon builds it. And this is where worship takes place in the same manner that was set up for the tabernacle, the, the tent which travelled around 
uh, with the children of Israel. But now it's talking at the end of those verses about by these regulations, verse 8, by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most high place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle or the temple and the system it represented were still in use. Our path to God wasn't freely open while the old system of law existed. So it had to be superseded or done away with or smashed to bits in order to open up the true way to God. It says in verse 9, this is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer were not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system oak deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, um, physical regulations that were in fact only until a better system could be established. So that old covenant was temporary. It was never meant to be um, forever and a day. It was never meant to be there as a permanent thing. It was only temporary until the chosen Messiah came. Again, the reason why you know, God talks right from the very beginning of Genesis about the one who will come and why Isaiah has that as well. and talks about Jesus coming, um, about our, our promised one uh, and how he will change things. And, and this form of covenant, this, this form of approaching God is something which changes. You know, for, for you to be a Jew and for you to be um, accepted uh, and for you to be able to access the temple for forgiveness, you have to then become Jew, a, a Jew uh, by adoption. So that meant um, for a man being circumcised, um, bringing your household up and teaching them the laws and the, and, and the ways, whereas now that's done away with. That's why so often in the New Testament, whenever you see a conflict going on between Jews and Gentiles and, and Jews are saying, but you must be circumcised, it's the only way. And, and yet the apostles are saying, no, it's not the only way. If you want to be a Jew, then that's what you do. And, and if you want to be a Jew that follows Jesus, then you do that, but you follow the new covenant. But as a Gentile, that doesn't apply to you. What applies to you is the fact that Jesus has died for your sins and you simply need to let him in to your life. That's the covenant that you follow. That's the relationship which God has promised to you because of what Christ has done. You know, we are not living in a world that, that loves rules and regulations. You only have to step out onto the road to drive to realise that. Um, you only have to walk outside your door at the minute to go into a shop and it says face covering required to realise that we live by rules and regulations. It gives us um, a framework by which to live. And if you think of God's people leaving Egypt, they were slaves. They didn't have a free will. And all of a sudden they become people who will make up their minds and themselves. They'll start to set up their own government, their own rules, their own regulations. So God gives them a framework by which to live, which is the Ten Commandments, as we call them, or the words of wisdom, and in the books of law, uh, and how they worship and how they approach God. And that is their framework. They needed that to give them structure for, to realise who God is, what he has done for them, and how they should follow him. Now, they struggle with it. Uh, and they rebel against him as human nature is. I mean, Adam and Eve rebelled against God. Why? So why shouldn't the Jewish people rebel against God? And, and the book of Judges is all about that. That downward spiral, they, they, they rebel, they, they fall under persecution. They cry out to God. God sends them a judge. They follow God for a while and they, they fall off again. And, you know, it, it's a continual hamster wheel. So it's in our nature to rebel. So that's why God gives us a framework, gives us his perfect standard as such. This is, this is how you would approach me. This is how, you know, what, why, the way you would do it. And that's what the tabernacle and the temple was all about. 
And the whole point of the priest was, because of sin, you can't come into my presence. Because of sin, it's a barrier and I can't look upon sin, God says. And if you come in with sin in your heart, I, I have to judge you. And that's why you, you will die. And, and that's why the, the high priest could only go into the, the very most central place, the most holy place once a year, and had to go with blood as a sacrifice for his sins and the sins of the nation. But Jesus changed that. Jesus dies for our sins and now we have grace. And that's what this new relationship is all about. It's about God's grace. About how whenever um, God looks at us, he sees the sacrifice of Jesus cleansing us from our sins if we have accepted him as our saviour. And, and, and again, as the New Testament talks about, you know, there is one who accuses us in God's presence. Who's Satan? Oh, look at that one. They call themselves a Christian. Huh. They call themselves a follower of you. Look what they have done. And then Jesus steps in and goes, they are covered by my blood. They have your grace, Father. So you don't need to judge them. Now, again, the New Testament tells us we will have to give an account for our actions. Scary thought. I'll have to give an account of myself before God for everything I have done. We've no idea what form that will take. We've no idea how that will happen. Because we don't know what heaven will truly be like. We know it'll be a wonderful place, but we don't know those parts, those bits. But we do know that, as God talks about new heaven and new earth in Revelation, there's no more sadness, no more tears or sorrow, no sickness, no suffering. It's a place where we are in God's presence. It's a place where we want to be. And that's what this new relationship is all about. Restoring our relationship so that we can have, so that we can be in God's presence. Wow. God loves us that much that he sent Jesus to die in our place. Jesus loves us that much that when he could have taken himself off the cross, he didn't. In fact, before that, Jesus loves us that much that in the Garden of Eden, whenever he could have turned around and said, Father, I'm not going to do this. He didn't have to. But he loves us so much that he does. Now, for us to love God back, to give back some of that love, because a covenant is a two-way relationship, or it should be a two-way relationship, so the covenant is whenever we open our lives up and we let God in, we ask for forgiveness and we, we, we have God's grace. But we should let that grace and God's, the outpouring of his love, change our life and change how we approach things. So that we approach people with God's love. How often do we judge people? How often do we criticise how often do we point the finger and go, oh, look at them. God doesn't do that with us. Whenever we have his forgiveness, he accepts us for who we are. Warts and all, as we say. And he loves us. And he is a true father. How can we truly love someone today? How can we truly love someone this Christmas time? How can we truly care for one another? You know, with government are asking us to care for one another by making sure we wash our hands, keep our two metres distance, wear our face masks, and as we come to church, that we are, we are sensible and we do the same as well. But how do we show God's love? How do we care for one another? How do we not judge one another? How do we accept one another, warts and all? And by showing a person love, God's love, how then God's love can transform that person so they can then show God's love to someone else. So ra rather than criticise someone tomorrow, how about we love them? Rather than ostracise someone and push them to the side, how about we include someone? Rather than putting somebody down, how about we build them up? That's what God's covenant does to us. 
So how can we let God's covenant change us to change others? Let's pray. Father, we've, we sing those words, make me a channel of your peace. And Lord, we are vessels for you to use. We are channels through which you can share your love with others. But Lord, we have to let our channel be open and not blocked. We have to allow that love to flow. Lord, show us the things which block that love, which get in its way, and then help us to remove them each day, to let your love flow through us to others, that they wouldn't see us or praise us, but they would see you, praise you, want to come to a closer relationship with you, so they too can then be a channel for your love, peace and blessing. Lord, thank you. Continue with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining in. Um, it's been great to have you um, with me. Next Wednesday will be the last Wednesday that I'm doing before Christmas because Wednesday the 23rd is our carol service in church. Um, also remember that the carol service on Sunday the 20th. If you haven't registered yet for our carol services, please do so. Um, the one on Sunday morning on the 20th is it's our traditional carol service of nine lessons and carols. The Wednesday evening will be done through modern pieces and videos and such like. Um, so if you'd like to register for one of them, please do so. Uh, we're asking to register for one and not both at this stage simply for numbers. But if we've got space, then yes, we can open it up that you can get along to both of them. But please let us know if you plan to come so we can um, book you in for it. But in the meantime, take care. God bless. And I will see you again next Wednesday. Bye.